about the potential of technology, what it does is it allows people to connect. It allows people to communicate across distance, across communities, uh, across all the sorts of divides and, and, and things that divide us as people. There's a recognition in this administration of just how powerful that is. I'm Devin Stewart from Carnegie Council. Welcome, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have the, the probably the most fun, uh, the funnest job uh, in, in the room. I get to keep everyone in line and simply introduce our speaker. Um, real quick, I, uh, I would like to mention uh, this is the second, this is the second or third time we've done something with Japan Society and the Carnegie Council on uh, digital social responsibility, ethics, and technology. It's a real pleasure, and I hope we can continue. Um, auspiciously, in the uh, New York Times yesterday, Google and Sony uh, tying up to create Google TV. So despite my, um, my provocatively dark uh, cover story this week in, in the Newsweek, um, in Newsweek Japan, and last week it was in Newsweek uh, Global Edition, where uh, they, they called my Newsweek piece um, Toyota and the End of Japan. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I didn't pick the title. Um, I, you know, and I mentioned uh, some of the trends in society, like, like um, for example, uh, asa for uh, ara, arasa or ara for people around 30s and their 40s who are, who are choosing to stay at home. And we have the ikikumori uh, expert in, in the back of the room, uh, Michael Zonsberger. Um, it's great to see you, Michael, and uh, it's a great audience here. So uh, you didn't hear, you didn't come here to see me. So I am going to turn it over to um, this incredible panel, and then I will. I will uh, guide the conversation. Um, it's a great pleasure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce one at a time. So, um, Kevin Werbach, he's from uh, the Wharton School. You have the bios. Um, uh, these, uh, some of these bios are, are more than, a, more, looks like almost a page, more than a page long. So, it's, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, but, but suffice it to say, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot. Uh, I, think, I think that despite some of the the negative and counter trends to, to IT, um, I think the, the general um, direction is positive toward a more open society that the Japan and the United States share um, as a common value. Uh, so, uh, Kevin Warbach, um, I, I give it to you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I appreciate uh, the invitation to come. I think ICTs our major area where Japan and the United States can learn from each other. Uh, although I was, I was disappointed to hear Mr. Takazawa-san mention that he taking Matsui as the example because I'm a Philadelphia Phillies fan living in Philadelphia, and so I'm not quite so happy with, with Mr. Matsui's success in the World Series last year. But putting that aside, um, this is certainly an area where both countries have tremendous accomplishments but also face tremendous challenges. I'd like to speak to you a little bit about the Obama administration and describe its approach to the internet and ICTs, uh, and then hopefully we can, we can follow up in the discussion and, and go more deeply into some other aspects. Um, my experience is that I was involved from the early days of the Obama campaign uh, as part of his technology, media, and telecommunications policy advisory group. Then after the election, served on the transition team for the new administration leading the review of the Federal Communications Commission and some of the technology policy areas. And then I've been working part-time as a consultant and advisor at both the FCC and the Commerce Department, uh, in addition to my, my main full-time job as a professor at the Wharton School. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I see these technology issues in the Obama administration. And I hate to be rude, but I, I find myself doing this often, uh, which is when I speak somewhere, taking issue with the title of the panel that I'm speaking on. Uh, and I was interested that this one is, is titled uh, Obama's Internet Initiative and, and Social Reform in the U.S. and Japan. Um, and from my perspective, there isn't an Obama Internet Initiative. The Obama administration itself is an Internet Initiative. The Internet and ICT are central to the way this administration operates and the way it thinks about uh, and looks at and interacts with the world. So let me very briefly uh, tell you about four aspects of uh, how ICTs, information communication technologies, and the internet uh, are, are core elements to the Obama administration's initiative. The, the first one I would call ICTs as grammar. We have a slogan in the transition team, which, which we call science is back, 
Uh, and the idea was that uh, not just that we were increasing spending on research, which the administration doubled spending on basic research, but much more broadly that uh, there was a strong belief in data-driven policy making. Uh, that the way the Obama administration wanted the U.S. government to operate was getting all the facts together, getting the best possible understanding, getting all the best possible arguments, and using that to make policy. Now, it's a bit odd that this should seem like a not one controversial way to, to make policy, uh, but that's the situation this administration came into. Um, that data-driven policy um, is intensely technology-based. It's all about data and information. Uh, my friend Kenneth Fouquet, who works for The Economist, actually based in Tokyo, just did a whole survey issue of The Economist on the power of information to transform our world. Uh, and this is a, a core way that this administration thinks about doing public policy. It's, it's one reason, structurally as well, the Obama administration brought in a chief technology officer and a chief information officer of the United States government for the first time. So, so the, the use of data and information is, is, is a core, not just to dealing with the technology sector, but to dealing with all of the major national challenges uh, and policy initiatives of the administration. Which leads to my second uh, way that, that ICT is central to this administration, which is ICT as a platform. Uh, going back to, if you look at the Obama campaign's technology platform, it talked about this notion that technology is a fundamental enabler for solving all of the great societal challenges that we had before. So you think about healthcare reform, a major policy initiative of this administration. Technology, whether it's electronic medical records, uh, whether it's finding ways to link up hospitals with broadband, uh, whether it's uh, other kinds of mechanisms to empower people to, to assist with <coughs> health care, uh, technology is a critical enabler, a central way that if we are ever able to improve health care in this country, technology is going to have to be a central part of it. The same thing with reform of education, energy, uh, all the other major initiatives. IT and technology is a, is a critical platform for them. That, that's something that, that imbues the way this Obama administration is addressing all sorts of issues. There are people in places like the FCC who are working specifically on technology issues. But if you look across the entire government, all the agencies of government, all the major initiatives, they have at their core recognition that, that technology can be a very valuable and, and in many ways essential way of solving these problems. Uh, the third one uh, I'll call ICTs as a tool. Uh, how does this administration put forth policy initiatives? I have up here on the screen, uh, on the web, uh, broadband.gov. Broadband.gov is the website for the National Broadband Plan that the FCC just uh, launched last week, in fact. Um, and I could have picked any number of other websites. There's data.gov, uh, which the federal government has put out so far over 118,000 standardized data sets of public information that are being made publicly available through the web. Uh, there's apps.gov, which is about uh, making uh, next generation IT applications available within the federal government. Uh, there's a whole series of these. This one is, is a good example. So the broadband plan is a document. It's a 376 page uh, <coughs> green binder document that was sent over to Congress. It has lots and lots of recommendations in it. But it's much more than that. This is the broadband plan. It's a dynamic website. As you see scrolling through, um, many of the topics relate to what I talked about. Broadband healthcare, for example, this recognition that information platforms, broadband networks, uh, are a, a critical tool for solving these major national problems. Um, but it's not just that. It's, it's the idea that policymaking is more than just documents, is more than just uh, passing legislation. Uh, but involves using the power of the internet and IT in all its ways. So here you see consumer broadband as the FCC recognizing the lack of data about just what kind of broadband is available, speeds and reliability and so forth, the broadband connectivity put out a tool and said to the American people, you test your broadband connection. 150,000 people uh, have uh, gone here and used this to test their broadband connection in the first week. That's providing a powerful reservoir of data to drive policy making. Uh, now in the that you see spectrum dashboards. So one of the areas that, that, that I work on and some of my academic work is spectrum policy. A uh, critically important area uh, for all of technology, making available more wireless capacity for next generation mobile broadband services. Um, so what the FCC realized was, we don't even know what the spectrum is being used for today. We don't have the information all in one place. Uh, the government, you can go to the 
FCC, they've got all sorts of information rooms, they've got internal databases and so forth. Uh, but what this administration did was said, let's put it up on the web. Let's create a dashboard where people can get information about uh, Spectrum Band, uh, what's being used, um, search for information, and, and use that as a portal into the agency. So these are just a, a few small examples relative to this one policy initiative. Uh, if you go to some of the other sites, there's a similar FCC one called OpenInternet.gov. There's an FCC proceeding dealing with whether they need to be rules, this is what's usually called network neutrality, to promote the openness of the internet. Um, you go there, you see not just a document, a notice of proposed rulemaking where the FCC is proposing uh, rules, although that's there. You see a video message from the chairman of the FCC explaining in his own words why he's launching this initiative and why it's important, and you see opportunities for people to comment. So there's tremendous opportunity to use technology to break out of what we in, in DC call the inside the beltway mentality, the inherent insularity of government, uh, which I know is, if anything, even a bigger issue in Japan. Uh, technology is a window out, and that leads to the, the fourth uh, aspect of ICT in this administration, uh, the last one I'd like to talk about, uh, which is taking the C in ICT Seriously, the C in, in ICT is communication. Uh, and uh, when you think about the potential of technology, what it does is it allows people to connect. It allows people to communicate across distance, across communities, uh, across all the sorts of divides and, and, and things that divide us as people. There's a recognition in this administration of just how powerful that is. And, and that goes back to the campaign. What the Obama campaign did so well was not just broadcast out its message through both traditional television as well as the internet to its supporters, what it did was it allowed its supporters to talk to each other. Through little things in some cases, like an iPhone application that would let you download your own phone book and make phone calls to people in battleground states that you knew to try and encourage them to vote for Obama, to tools that let people have house parties and so forth. This was during a campaign, and this has been moved into the administration. Uh, the Obama administration has launched a major open government initiative. Um, and the Open Government Initiative has as one element transparency, making the government policy making process more open and transparent through things like disclosing lobbying, disclosing meetings, uh, allowing review of regulations and so forth. But transparency is just the first leg of that initiative. The second leg is participation, allowing people to actually contribute, citizens to contribute to the process. And the third leg is collaboration, facilitating people connecting with each other uh, and being able to do great things using, uh, again, this platform of technology, this platform of the government as a starting point. And, and that's really a, a hallmark more broadly of the way this administration thinks about things. And, and a reason that, I, that I'm encouraged and excited, despite all of the challenges and delays and controversies that we're seeing, uh, that something is being built here in this country that's very powerful, not just limited to, to the US, um, and ultimately irreversible. Once that culture gets created, things get opened up in a powerful way. So to, to wrap up, the, the broadband plan, I think, is a perfect example um, of this kind of mentality. The National Broadband Plan of the United States, the title on the front of that document is Connecting America. Certainly one of the reasons for the initiative for the broadband plan is a recognition that the US is far behind peer nations in terms of any index of broadband connectivity. But if you read that document, you don't see a whole lot about the US is falling behind and we have to catch up. You see a lot about the potential of broadband to serve national ends. Because connecting America means several different things. It means physically stringing fiber optic cable and making possible mobile wireless connections to every corner of the country and all that that enables. Uh, but it also means connecting and what I think this administration in IT is very much about is the idea of connecting people, connecting America to the rest of the world, connecting citizens to their government, and also connecting citizens to each other. That's the potential, and I think that's a model that uh, could very well be applied in Japan and other countries as well, and I very much look forward to the further discussion here to get into some of these issues. Thank you very much.
State Department, and I think I, I just want to underscore how important what Kevin just said um, is to the administration broadly speaking. The United States is trying to think about uh, what, what, is, what is its role um, with, with the rise of, of, of emerging powers right now, and, and the freedom agenda is in question of, of the Bush administration. Um, containment was in the past, and, and um, I haven't really uh, hit on what Anne Marie Slaughter and others are talking about uh, throughout the government, which is convening, catalyzing, and connecting. And those, those are sort of the mantras of, um, of the U.S. Uh, agencies right now, and, and this is just one manifestation um, that the United States sees itself as a responsible and credible convener of, of, of countries uh, and organizations and, and companies, and, and they also see nothing can be done without the cooperation of civil society and companies. So I'm going to turn uh, right over to our next speaker, uh, Toshihiro Yoshihara. Uh, he is a, a visiting fellow at the Japan Chair of CSIS, where I'm still an adjunct fellow. Um, and uh, he's on loan from NTT. So uh, Yoshihara-san, please. Thank you.
And the uh, map on this slide reflects almost the real actual size of the land. So as you can see, the, so the size of Japan is almost the same as uh, it's just one state of California. But, but uh, the number on the United States representing the whole United States. So the land sizes are very different between Japan and United States, and also the population density is uh, totally different. So the time and cost for the broadband proliferation should be different between the Japan and the United States. But regarding the fixed line broadband, so wireline based broadband, the penetration is almost the same. So this data is a little bit old. So currently, the both has the more than 60% now. The difference is on the mobile side. Japan is historically a very mobile centric, and uh, 3G data communications were very, very popular. In the United States, now getting the popularity after the iPhone launched a couple of years ago. That is the one of the difference of the Japan and the United States. The another difference is the speed of the internet in the wireline side. So this is the uh, type of the broadband service subscribed in Japan. And uh, you can, as you can see, the FTTH, FTTH stands for fiber to the home, is the most popular access service in Japan now. And it generally offers the 100 megabit per second to each home. In the United States, uh, Verizon and other small companies offering the FTTH service here, but the available area is very limited in the high density area. So I think it takes a very, very long time for FTTH to become a very common access service in the United States because of the very huge peak land. And uh, this is a kind of additional information regarding the broadband infrastructure. So although we had uh, several government initiatives so far, that does not mean the government spending is, is so large. So in Japan, the mainly the public sector has led the broadband deployment. So regarding the broadband infrastructure, it is so far so good in Japan. That in some ranking set it says Japan ranked as a number one or number two. But the program is in the ICT utilization side. So the, this slide shows that Japan is uh, lagged behind from other countries. So in education, the government, and the healthcare area, so ICT is not so utilized so well. This slide is another example that shows that Japan is behind from other advanced countries. So this is a connectivity scorecard created by the London Business School teacher, Dr. Weberman. And this scorecard is calculated based on the program deployment and also ICT usage on the government, businesses, and consumers. So under this situation, the Japanese government has been trying to expand the ICT usage. And this is the newest one expected to come coming out the next month. <coughs> and the UK newspaper reported the discussion draft just two days ago and the might cover these three areas. The first one is the e government, the second one is the social human network, and that mainly focuses on the healthcare area. And the third one is uh, new business and global business. So uh, I don't know it in detail, but we are looking forward to seeing it. So let me give you some example of uh, ICT usage for the social purposes. The first one is called the national. EPO box, electrical hot PO box. Um, this is described in uh, I Japan strategy uh, developed by the last government led by the LDP. So this is a kind of one-stop service for the residents to access the pension information and uh, public insurance information and the medical information like that. So this service is expected to be launched by 2013, but uh, currently the government is changed to the TPJ, so that it's a little bit unclear now. The second example is the ICT usage in the local government in Okinawa. So uh, in this system, for example, 
uh, they established the EHL platform, you know, right now, EHL stands for Electric Health Record. So, and uh, they make it shareable among the government and the medical institutes and the, some related to public sector. So they can share the, each person's health, health record very easy and in a timely fashion. So they streamline the process, internal process. The third one is the smart grid. The kind of smart grid is a kind of buzzword both in the United States and Japan. And it doesn't have a specific definition so far, but I think it generally means the ICT usage for the effective use of energy or effective production of electric energy. So this is just one example I found recently. This project consisting of uh, electric company and uh, entities, the telecommunications company, gas company, trading company, and also an academic. So I think uh, there are many projects or some initiative is going on both in the United States and Japan and in this area. So the if broadband or internet become a platform for uh, such kind of applications for social purposes, I think more and more personal data and the critical data is falling on the net. In this situation, I think security and the privacy protection is a very, very important. So the government and also the private sector and industry body should give a very high priority on cybersecurity. Um, in addition, the another concern is uh, quality. So the internet is a basically best effort size. That means it cannot assure 24-7 assure connection. And if the network is very congested, they cannot assure real-time based communications. So if the network congested in, in the very critical applications like uh, telemedicine, it's going to be a very fatal problem. Okay. So one possible solution is a managed IP network. For example, so NTT uh, launched the NGN. The NGN stands for the Next Generation Network. So this network has a function that can prioritize some specific communications. And the NTT is, is opening up the, this function to the other third vendors. So any provider can use the, this function. So the finally, I will, let me talk about uh, relating the open government policy as a Dr. Burbank talked about. So while I'm watching the development of the National Broadband Plan, I found the policy development process is a very, very different between the United States and Japan. So I think, yeah, totally agree with Dr. Burbank. I think the National Broadband Plan is the best example of the, this Obama open government policy, I think. So they're not only using a, a website for the collecting uh, opinions from the consumers, but also they had uh, many, many workshops and um, no, uh, made uh, public notice for collecting uh, comments. So they collected uh, 75,000 pages. So I don't think the guys, FCC staffs uh, read through the, <laughs> these whole pages. Uh, so that's a, a very, very open process. On the other hand, in Japan, uh, <clears throat> it is strategy, and so, so uh, of course, so the government was collecting the public comment before announcing that each strategy government major initiatives, but the number of comments are very limited. And also, it is very unclear how those comments are reflected on the final version. So this is the difference. So I don't give uh, any specific recommendation to the Japanese government here, but uh, I think my feeling is that just importing the U.S. model doesn't work in Japan because of the some culture difference or some IT literacy difference and so on. So maybe the Okada-san will talk about a little bit on those issues. So that's pretty much my, my presentation. Thank you very much.
next we have uh, Kazuya Okada um, from NTT Data Agile Net, and uh, he is going to talk about the lack of innovation in, in Japan, which is a great segue and, and something that I've been following closely as well. Very, really looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, one thing he did mention was that back to that really challenged when it comes to public speaking. And I've never done this slides, so please bear with me and uh, make it as less painful as possible. <laughs> and today I'm going to talk about why there seems to be insufficient innovation in Japan in the uh, area of information technology. The description for today's event alluded to the fact that there seems to be a gap, a strange gap between the maturity of IT infrastructure in Japan and the level of innovation that's derived from it. And this is my take on the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> this is no way an exhaustive chart and it's not even uh, a cause and effect diagram, but um, I think it uh, covers some key points. For example, we're going to go uh, in one of those positions and go around the country on both sides. So the first inhibitor, uh, those hard to get rid of, don't know why it's still there kind of old tradition. For example, in, in Japan, if you've been there, you know, uh, there is almost no online meeting. Almost every meeting's face to face. And only a few office has video uh, conference equipment. And uh, even if your telephone handset has the uh, conference call feature, uh, they don't know how to use it. Uh, not because of lack of literacy, but you know, they so rarely use it, they forget how to use it. Same with the reluctant, uh, uh, you know, the utilization of telework. I mean, they have the fastest internet in the world, but they don't use it for remote meeting or remote view. And then there's a tendency to avoid or even frown upon you know, disruptive change. Maybe that comes from the fact that you know Japan is generally uh, has you know farming mentality especially compared to the United States, which maybe has more hunting or hunter kind of mentality. So if you're a farmer, then you must collaborate you know, to survive, I guess, you know, more than you know, when you're a hunter. And perhaps that's why you know, everybody who has a kid in Japan is told to conform, not to differ. And there's, uh, yeah, and the last point that I put over there is the value that, you know, you should work harder. And it is, it is a uh, good spirit, of course, but in the United States, especially the OMB, which is the Office of uh, Management and Budget in Washington, D.C., uh, the administrator uh, once said, you know, it's okay, it's good to work harder, but I want you to work smarter. Not just harder, smarter. And um, I wonder if Japan has this concept. Now, uh, moving on to the next set of factors that might be contributing to the fact that these patients are in Japan. Uh, well, but you know, there might be they, they might be innovative, actually. For example, look at Walkman or Wii and hybrid vehicle. They're all innovative. But just not in the information technology sector or in the public sector for some reason. The other point I'd like to make on this uh, set of factors is the fact that Toyota has been very successful with Kaizen and uh, it inevitably tends to be uh, incremental um, improvement, and perhaps that's why some disruption.
disruptive and innovative change is not uh, abundant in Japan. And of course, one successful, if you're a farmer especially, one successful, you tend to cling to that success. I mean, you know, because it, it's, it's a good pattern. I mean, you know that that procedure will work and give you a good return on investment. But sometimes, you know, you just, uh, you know, cling to that success too long and it's, uh, you, know, you know, realize that it's obsolete and the environment has changed and everybody else has adapted to the new world and performing better than you are. Next set of factors. Even if you can innovate, um, you don't want to innovate. Or you really want to innovate, but the environment does not allow you to innovate. For example, weak economy. Everybody knows that Japan is suffering from 20 years of weak economy, and that obviously discourages investments that, you know, that uh, you're not sure uh, what the outcome will be. It's just risky. And talking about risk, Maybe it is less risky to follow than to explore. Not maybe, it's probably so. So why innovate? I mean, let somebody do the innovation, and I'll just uh, utilize it, perhaps improve upon it, and you know, have a better ROI than that innovator. it is sometimes prohibited to be implemented. For example, Japan has very strict privacy law, and that new idea that they have just come up with uh, may not be uh, legal. Or there is strong legal concern, and you know, it's very difficult to overcome, and very costly, you know. The other fact, <coughs> factor is the, the another cultural issue lack of uh, incentivizing innovation. So, for example, if you are a very innovative guy and try to bring innovation to your uh, workplace, but it's very risky. First of all, even if you do succeed, it's under-rewarded. I mean, there's not much reward. But if you do fail, then there is uh, punishment and uh, often irreparably, uh, irreparable damage. And <clears throat> I think this is the last point, but uh, I think that this is one of the most important points, which is that the way they use or, or uh, utilize information technology, which is to me, it seems that they're just automating their existing traditional business process or the way of life, rather than making the, the, the way you perform business or the, the way you live uh, adapt to the technology so that, make, so that you can make the full use of that. Okay, leaving that first chart, uh, this is a brief comparison of the technology history of Japan and the US. Um, but in early 1990s, there was this thing called DOS B, which was like uh, Commodore Perry arriving in Yokohama in uh, opening up Japan to the world, which enabled <coughs> to use Japanese characters on the world standard IBM PC. The other trend that uh, took place in Japan in late 90s to uh, early 2000 is the fixed price ISPs. So until then, you, you had to pay per use, you know, per time, but you know, with the introduction of ABSL and uh, other technology, uh, you know, you, you, no matter how much you use your internet, or no, no, matter, no matter how much you surf and stay online, then you're going to have to 
pay about the set, set price. So that was a big boom. And then that, uh, right, uh, and the next evolution was DigiPan, as uh, Mr. Shahar mentioned, and uh, was the movement towards uh, making, or similar to the information superhighway on the upper right, uh, which is to make Japan's landline very high speed and very available everywhere. So I digress, but uh, what I wanted to show on this slide is that Japan has imported or adopted several concepts and technology trends from the US, but they have left out some key points or key initiatives. And perhaps that is why uh, some some uh, import is failing, uh, especially in the recent years. For example, enterprise architecture, uh, very important movement in the United States. However, when imported to Japan, it's been filtered and modified uh, that it means completely something else. And it did not result in the optimization of the organizational structure of the government. And I fear that same thing might be happening in open government. Uh, we'll see, but I'm not quite confident that Japan sees this opportunity as uh, you know, data democracy or democratic uh, movement. Perhaps it's just a way of uh, you know, giving public more opportunity to comment, not necessarily making good of it. So uh, that's my 10 minutes, and this is my contact. I'm located in Washington, D.C., uh, I forgot to mention, but I uh, work for NTP Data, uh, which is the largest systems integrator in Japan. And, uh, and my agenda is uh, to change Japan to NTP Data. <laughs>
But the, the gist of it is, is how is it you can reach out to different audiences in a way that is contemporary and relevant to them. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been looking at, that we think and I've been looking at for the last uh, couple of years, is how can we improve cultural relations outreach? Um, and our governments, our organizations, our corporations, using these uh, technologies in a way that actually is resonant with the audiences. Um, I'm gonna, uh, there's a, um, one of the examples, uh, a more recent one, I'll, I'll back up for a second uh, to um, explain it. One of the issues that I think uh, both the Japanese government and the US government uh, uh, is challenged by is the fact that the, and it was referenced in some of the previous speakers, is that the, the culture of the bureaucracy does not lend itself for innovation. I think one of the great things that Kevin uh, highlighted in the Obama administration's approach to technology policy is that it is trying to encourage a, a culture of innovation. The challenge, I think, is how do you get the bureaucratic culture that is uh, that, that is accustomed in the U.S. to a four-year cycle of governments, of executive branches coming in and coming out, which introduce new policies. You can. I, I was. I was, uh, I was struck by the by looking at the, the history of the of, of IT tech policy in the U.S. and Japan, and I remember that in the 1990s when Al Gore brought in reinventing government into the U.S., which had a certain similar flavor to a lot of what the Obama administration has been trying to do, which is how can we break through these silos of government and really create collaboration and cooperation with, uh, with the use of technology. But I think there are a lot of challenges ahead uh, still to go. Um, one of them I'd like to cite is an example of how the U.S. State Department has room to grow, room to improve on, on their work uh, in, in this particular way. And I think the challenge is that while new technologies have, and, and advocates of, of creative uses of new technologies have been brought into government, um, the government people who are actually on the front lines of cultural relations, and I think that the, 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 the Japan society is very much on the front lines of cultural relations and cultural engagement, those are the, those are the um, people that, that need um, to be engaged and need to be informed and educated the most. Um, on September 1st, 2009, the new U.S. ambassador to Kenya, Michael E. Rannenberger, who was a career foreign service officer with deep experience on the African continent, started a Twitter feed. And most all of us in this room by now are aware of Twitter as a, as a popular social media outlet. Um, one of the things that, uh, that in his seven, that when the, right after the, uh, uh, this came out, it was lauded as, as the first example of Twitter diplomacy. Um, Reuters uh, did a big story about how this innovative use of technology was, was was finally being, being applied to cultural relations. Um, but one of the questions that I have is, was, the, was this technology being used in a way that is contextually relevant? Um, in Twitter, one of the ways that you can convey to, some, to your followers or, to, or to, to people a sense that you're actually in a conversation with them is by following them. And we can see that as of yesterday, this, this screenshot, Ambassador Randenberger was following no one. In, uh, that, well, well, that is sort of a subtle thing in the culture of, of, of Twitter. What it means is I'm listening to you. And I think that you uh, and the Japan Society understand that very, clear, very clearly because the conversations and the events that you have are about listening to people as well as speaking to them. How do we create dialogue? Well, in, as we introduce these new forms of social media into <coughs> our diet of cultural engagement, we need to understand that, that the rules don't change. The rules of cultural engagement never take, ne never remove that I have to listen to you as well as speak to you. That's how dialogue and transformation and cultural tra tra transformation take place. So I list this as an example of the way, uh, of, of challenges that um, people who are on the front lines of cultural engagement need to overcome, mainly that uh, I think there are some uh, preconceived ideas that Technology is a broadcast medium, not a collaborative and a dialogue medium. And I think that the that those who are in who are who are part of the conversation using social media realize that it is really a conversation. This was actually borne out by uh, our the US's new undersecretary for public diplomacy, Judith McHale, who recently came into office uh, under President Obama. She says we have to engage even when we disagree with others. We have to communicate two-way communication, not one-way messaging the, through both government people to people dialogue. Um, the, uh, and of course, my, my uh, uh, previous example illustrates that not everyone in, in, the, in the foreign service is fully as fully applying this. Um, uh, Rita J. King and I did a project, as Deva mentioned, uh, called Digital Diplomacy at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. And in this effort, we actually went and explored the role of virtual worlds 
virtual worlds uh, are really immersive spaces uh, that, that Japanese culture is uh, very familiar with because of the uh, prevalence of the video game culture in Japan as well as in, in the US. Um, but it was our premise that in these spaces, substantive cultural dialogue and opportunities for cultural engagement were arising that weren't necessarily being used by governments or NGOs or societies. Uh, the end result, what we found in this particular case study, which was looking at opportunities for engaging uh, uh, Islamic societies, was that there was a massive, untapped uh, community in which dialogue was taking place that was substantive and meaningful. And we argued, actually, that was augmenting uh, the kinds of uh, dialogue that take place in exchange programs. I was an exchange student in Brazil when I was 16. For the past uh, uh, 30 years, I have carried with me that experience as a transformative experience. These 3D immersive spaces provide new opportunities, not for replacing uh, um, exchange programs, but for augmenting the kind of dialogue that takes place. In an era of fiscal austerity, we talked about the past 20 years of economic decline in Japan, the US is, is also suffering heavily. How do we find ways that when we can't afford to fly everyone, when we can't afford to bring someone to Japan or to the United States for, for a month or six months or a year long stay, what can we do to, uh, to build a relationship that, is, that, that uses technology in a way that, is, uh, that fully embraces it, its potential for dialogue? Uh, why should we do this? Uh, here's just one, one chart showing the rapid growth rate of people who are using virtual worlds worldwide. Uh, if, if, if people aren't aware of, of, of this reality, if you haven't considered the fact that, the, that, that not only the virtual world, but social media are rapidly becoming a part of the conversation, this is, here's an example. This is a screenshot I took last night of, of, uh, of a Japanese um, community in the virtual world of Second Life, where you can see they have these, this robust um, uh, uh, rebuilding of, of palaces and, uh, and such. The, uh, but I, one of the things that I often, uh, uh, we often find in our, when we, when we don't like, uh, uh, give these, these conversations is that, that, is that um, the response from the policy community is that they, is that there's a perception that this is, a, the choice is a binary, that if you, that you have to either use, uh, uh, that if you do uh, technological cultural relations, then you're actually, that you're implicitly um, uh, uh, removing the physical world exchanges. Um, and, and actually, we, we disagree with that. We think that this should be part, an integral part of your outreach efforts. It should be a part of the overall tapestry of outreach and communication that is done <coughs> in order to facilitate better understanding. A lot of the other things that, that, that challenge people who are senior members of, of, of uh, cultural outreach um, projects are that the technology looks unfamiliar, that the interface is different. And I think this is a big challenge that needs to be overcome. When I, um, uh, when I interviewed a series of foreign service officers over the past year for an article that I published this past fall, I asked them, what, in their posts, in, in their foreign countries, in the foreign countries to which they're assigned, how well is, uh, is new media, or social media, or even immersive media technology being used? How can it be applied? Their frustrations, which was, I think, I mean, constructive to, to a lot of the topics we, we that the other speakers have, have mentioned, was that the, uh, when they were brought back to their home country, in, in this case, I was interviewing US Foreign Service Officers, they were brought back to Washington for technology training. And uh, in the course of that, the training was being taught by engineers, not by cultural relations people. So you have a disconnect where people who are actually only in charge of building the tools don't actually have experience in applying the tools. So they, they would go, they would spend two weeks in, in, in training, they go back to their country, but none of this would be contextualized in a way that was relevant to their outreach efforts. And I think that's a critically important thing. And as we think about how is it that ICTs are used in cultural relations, how is it that we are, we are trying to encourage innovation, we need to also think about the fact that people who are on the front lines of doing cultural engagement need to have this technology contextualized in a way that's relevant to them. Um, that's, those are sort of my key points. Uh, I realize I think we're, I don't know how we're on, on time, but, the, but my recommendations are that, that that I continue to sort of try to reframe is that we need to find a way to integrate context, culture, and training into innovation, especially when, it, when it's uh, applied to cultural relations. I think that there is a massive opportunity, uh, a much, uh, a, a, an opportunity that we're missing to create and expand our global conversation across cultures for 